It's a uh, mental health. I've been in Ecuador late, late 60s, and uh, I was working a lot in domestic violence. So I'm not doing that right now. Janet Culpepper, I was in Micronesia from 7981. Um, former um, coordinator for the um, for the Massachusetts um, training for medical interpreters at um, UMass, oh. and um, currently substitute teaching and also doing some work with UMass on a contract basis, and training doctors and cultural competence, Good. which my Peace Corps training Good. helped a great deal. Great. I'm Heidi. I met you when I worked at the United Way and recently transitioned to Backpack Humanity. I was in Peace Corps in Kenya, 2006 to 2008, and interestingly, I was evacuated because there was a civil war there, and we recently, I'm not sure if you read about it in the paper, woman Fabiola, who was a champion of change, yep. She received a habitat home in oh. March. So it's just really interesting, like going through my evacuation from a place that I was voluntarily living in, speaking with her, who had been evacuated multiple times, right. and is now receiving a service that I'm, Great, yeah. I'm helping provide. So well, thank you for doing that. Thank you for everything you're doing for us. I've been working with the United Nations for 20 years. I served in Liberia, 64 to 66. And I'm a therapist in career counseling here in this room. I've been working with Lattice for years. Good. And my name is Bill Lewis. I am now, I guess I'm now a social activist. <laughs> and I was in uh, northern Kenya, 74 through 76. And I'm actually going to ask a bit of your advice in a moment. And um, we'll go from there. Hi, Mr. Congressman. How are you? I'm doing good. <laughs> it's always good when we're here with you. Um, I'm Tim Garvin, I run the United Way and have the honor and privilege to work with you and work with your office and your staff to try and make the central Massachusetts, the commonwealth in our country, the great place that it can be and should be and is. We had a great year in the Peace Corps this past year. Non-official, I decided we should create a, a one-page select highlights. So, and Virginia here, here's okay. a copy for you, and this is just these are the things that I knew about that we worked on. Peace Corps Caucus started, um, 88 members now. That's good. Uh, the Peace Corps Commemorative Bill. My personal congressperson, Catherine Clark, her first vote in the House yeah. was voting for that. Yeah. That was good. Um, Peace Corps Day of Action, Bill and I came down. It was the biggest day of action we've ever had. 101 people came from all over the country. We had 175 meetings. I think Bill and I had eight of them together, <laughs> and the most interesting were the June I, I, Congress District Two from Arkansas. And I can't remember the name of the gentleman from there. Very different than here, and yet they listened. And his legislative director vacationed out on the Cape, so that was good. So we made good inroads there. Um, the Peace Corps funding letter, the biggest signing we've ever had. I was thrilled that we had all nine of our Massachusetts good. Congress people. We had per capita more than any other state. In fact, we have eight on the caucus. One is not yet on, and we're still working on that. We'll talk about that later. Um, after being the interim director for close to a year, we finally were able to get Carrie Hessler Rattlet um, confirmed. We thought that was great. I don't know if you've met her yet. I know, but no. I look forward to it. We like, I, I'm thrilled both because of her service, what she did after her service, and that she's now leading the Peace Corps. And then um, just two other wonderful little factoids. 65 countries around the world, that's where we're still, this is as of this morning, so I guess it was 67 until last week, and we pulled, we suspended Kenya again, and then we pulled out of Liberia for obvious reasons. And um, as of this morning, 7,209 Americans are serving our country and the world. Good. So we have a simple ask, and then we, we have a, uh, an offer for you. Okay. The simple ask um, is there's a, a bill in Congress called the Peace Corps Respect Act, and it would allow, should any of us wish when we pass away, to finally be able to use the Peace Corps insignia on our gravestones if we wish. Right now, technically, we're not allowed to. We have a copy of the bill, and I'll pass that all over to you. I can't believe that's our biggest ask, and yet it's meaningful, and the reason we do this every year is because service 
30 years ago or 10 years ago has remained important to us. The, the bigger offer and ask is uh, Peace Corps funding in the President's budget went up $1 million this past year, $379 to $380 million. We know things in Congress, and you always speak eloquently about it. We would love to see the champions of the Peace Corps um, really say we need to accelerate that. And Heidi and I had lunch before this, and, and please everybody add in, but I'm still a firm believer that when you build relationships and you have inroads and you bring the world home, that those big conflicts that we're still involved in all of a sudden don't get to that level. And I think the Peace Corps is one of the greatest ways that we have done that, to take the best of America and the bring the best of the world home and get people into leadership positions so that we we allow people to see the peace is important. Just add one, one more thing. Uh, I am more of a program director these kind of mm -hmm. terms, and I found that amazing people go into the Peace Corps and learn a lot about living in another country, which is quite unusual. Um, but the biggest thing is when they come home, they're really different. We're, we're different, don't you think? And, and so I think that is huge for the country as well because we are working in our communities and we're doing amazing things in our communities. Those of us who get a taste of what it is, I think we have a different lens than a lot of people because it's very, very, we have such a huge country with very um, little access to other countries and much, much different than the rest of the world. So I think it's, it's incredible what we contribute to the country. Well, look, I appreciate you being here um, and giving a copy of the Peace Corps Respect Act. I'm happy to go on it. Um, so just tell me what the bill number is and who, who's the author. Um, and I'm look, anything I could do to help accelerate funding and push for more funding, I look, I mean, I, I, I tell people I like the Peace Corps not only, not only because it's the, um, uh, because I, I think it, uh, you know, it, it uh, reflects the best of our country, you know, um, you know, you're helping people get on their feet, you're helping people who, um, you, know, uh, you know, you know, be able to, whether it's in agriculture or whether it's in building a building or whether it's in teaching or whether, I mean, you name it, I mean, it's, it's a service that that is really important, that it touches people's lives directly. Uh, and, um, and I also... I'm a big supporter of the Peace Corps because, uh, you know, I think that countries that host the Peace Corps tend to like us, you know, and I think when people like us, they don't want to blow us up. So I think that from a national security <laughs> perspective, it's like oh this is gosh. a, this is a, you know, this is a, this is something that yeah. we ought to not only support but expand. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at what's going on. And I just got off a, a, a long conference call about all the mess that's going on in Iraq and and I you know and I'm really depressed because there's such a lack of imagination in terms of how you respond to some of these difficulties around the world and you know and by that I mean we're always told you get you do one of two things you can either do nothing or you can bomb them okay. and around. you know and I and there's there's got to be something in between you know, and um, you know, and I'm not saying that the Peace Corps would solve the problem with ISIS in the, <laughs> in, the in the in in Iraq. But what I am saying is, the more we support these efforts, you know, I think the more goodwill, you know, we we gain for ourselves. But also, I think we live up to this kind of the moral underpinnings of our country, which is that we're supposed to believe in human rights and mm -hmm. and you know support people who are in need, whether they're in the United States or. Know, halfway down the block, or whether they're halfway around the world, and um, you know, I do a lot of work on hunger and nutrition and sustainable agriculture. You know, uh, not only here in the United States but globally, because I think that the one thing that we all have in common is, you know, we all care about being able to have enough to eat. We care about our families. We care about their security. You know, we have kids. We care about making sure they get an education. They get fed. They have health care. You know, I mean, we're all the same, no matter where you live in that regard. And, uh, you know, and I also, you know, I don't know, I'm still kind of a little bit of an idealist. Um, and I think this, this is, you know, 
peace corps, I feel proud of my country. So, so I'm, I'm happy to, you know, be helpful where I can. Can I ask you about, you know, that middle ground that you said was there between the bombing and the American? Um, what can we do to change the mindset of the American people? Well, because I think that Actually, I'm writing a book about that very topic. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I think when you said that um, having spent time overseas and in the Peace Corps, that you see things from a different lens, that you have a different perspective, um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, you have members of Congress who take great pride in bragging about the fact they don't have a passport. I think that, uh, to me, that's a sign of ignorance, but they think it's a sign of, this is why you should support me. And um, and I think you know I think I think the way you get to that kind of middle ground is you get more people to do this kind of stuff. People who do it need to talk to their elected officials, you know, and talk about the success stories. You know, I mean, I, I'm not even sure the American people quite understand that there's a lot of things that we do and invest in that are huge successes. This is one of them. You know, um, you know our food aid programs. You know, uh, sustainable agricultural development programs, um, housing programs. I mean, uh, I would throw in medical research. Medical, me medical, medical research. Medical, but I mean, in terms of what we do overseas, invest overseas, uh, even you know, immunizations. Right. You know, I mean, I mean, young kids are. The, it, the impact that what Bush did right. with right. Uh, right. HIV in Africa. Right. Right. Just, I mean, right. it's not a president that I was saying, no. but. That was, was a, that was yeah, the greatest realized. thing that he ever did, yeah, and right. it made yeah. a real impact on what was happening to that whole continent. And I remember I was in Africa, I was in Kenya, I was in, in Ethiopia and Chad, but in Ethiopia and Kenya I went to HIV AIDS clinics. This was after PEPFAR was up and running. And I expected that um, the problem I would find at these clinics would be that they don't have the antiretroviral drug mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, that they, that they were missing. I went. They all, they had they had the drugs. I mean, some some a lot of them provided by the Clinton Foundation, by the way. Um, um, but but the problem was not the drugs; it was the food. They didn't have the food, and you can't take the drugs on an empty stomach. Right. And so people weren't taking the drugs because they didn't have food. And um, I mean, so but I you know but you, you know we, we and I I just came back from. Like, the border. Well, I was well. I was on the board before, but I, I literally just came back uh, you know, the day before yesterday from five days in the far reaches of Maine, where phones don't work, where not, it's you know, and it's like, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of like in, a fact finding trip, right, you know, just, just <laughs> my family, just to just that, and um, you know, and then and then you come back and you see you hear all the news, um, and it's really really discouraging. I went, to, I went to the border. I was down in, um, the week before, I went down to Texas um, to the border and mm -hmm. crossed over into Reynosa, Mexico, the, the area where there's the greatest number of apprehension of undocumented immigrants, where there's also the greatest number, sadly, of immigrants who cross the Rio Grande into the United States and die um, because of lack of water. It's really, it right, it's just, you know. Um, but I went down there because of this ugliness surrounding you know what to do with these kids who didn't come here by sneaking across the Rio Grande River who came to and were turned in uh, and said that they would be sent back um, if if, uh, if they were sent back they'd be killed mm -hmm. and um, and I went up and I was we had an ugly debate in Congress the week before that was so ugly that mm -hmm. you know I, I felt I want to go over and, you know, punch somebody. That's how upset I was by just the, just the disrespect for people, you know, unbelievable. But, you know, I, I went down to see, you know, for myself, and, you know, you had in, in basically jail cells, because that's most of the undocumented population that we apprehend go into these cells. They're like jail cells. Most of them are adults. But in one cell, you have kids from four to maybe eight years old, 30, you know, cell with one bat, one toilet in the middle, with no privacy, and and um, you know, all these kids are like frightened to death because they journeyed from El Salvador or Honduras or from Guatemala. Here they are; their parents are not with them, and they're in a, you know, in a, in basically a cell with glass. 
you know, touching the glass, just, you know, trying to get attention. And then I was told, look, we, you know, we, we weren't prepared for this, so we made better accommodations. They show me where the better accommodations were, an empty warehouse where they built cages. And you have mm-hmm. kids in cages. You know, it was better mm-hmm. than the jail cells, and they had porta johnnies, which was a little bit better. But nonetheless, you're a, you know, you're a young kid, and you're in a, in a cell, and um, talking to these kids, and, you know, you know, I mean, El Salvador, the more people are dying today in El Salvador than were during the war. Mm-hmm. Honduras is the most dangerous country in the world. More, Percentage-wise, more murders happen in Honduras every day than in Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, and I was, I came back, I wrote a piece for the, the Telegram because we get some hate mail. I think I should just explain to them, you know, what, what I saw. And I, and I closed by saying, you know, there are 50 million refugees in the world. And the United States government routinely scolds countries, like whether it's Jordan or whether it's Lebanon or whatever, I mean, whatever Turkey. any Turkey, whatever, and say, you're not doing enough to help these refugees fleeing civil war in, in Syria or ISIS in, in Iraq or whatever. And, you know, you have an obligation, a moral obligation to take care of those refugees. And some of them have millions of refugees living on their border. And we expect them to do that. So you have 50 million refugees worldwide, 50,000 kids show up to our, mm-hmm. our border, you know, um, and that's one-tenth of one percent of all the refugees mm-hmm. in the world, one-tenth of one percent. And you get members of Congress having a hissy fit that we can't help these kids. It's like embarrassing. But part of the reason why is because I don't think these, these got people ever go down and actually see these kids or talk to these kids or even visit places like El Salvador, or Guatemala, or Honduras. They have no idea what's going on in the world. You know, everything is just, you know, black and white, no gray. I mean, it's, just, it's this or that, and there's nothing, you know. And um, and so to get to your point, I, I mean, I, we, we, need to, we need to begin more thoughtful discussions, not only with our elected leaders, but hopefully with the next generation of elected of leaders, where, you know, more activities on college campuses, talking about things like the Peace Corps, talking about, you know, our development programs, talking about, you know, human rights issues or whatever like that. I mean, there ought to be more of an attempt to kind of get us to understand that the world is getting smaller. And, um, and we have a responsibility here. And no, not, not to be the policeman of the whole world, not to shoot everybody in, in or occupy every country, but, you know, and you know, the people that you've helped in the countries you were at, what about the roles were reversed? You know, you know, that you were in Ecuador, or you were in Kenya, or you were, you know, you know, and you were struggling, and then somebody came and helped make your life a little bit better. I mean, boy, I, 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 I don't understand what you, I think that makes, makes the world a better place, you know, but that's me. I, I was asking the question because I'm very concerned with the attitudes you're finding in Congress. And I know a lot of people in this country are very concerned about it. Yeah. I just talked to a reporter, you know, and he said, well, the president says we're not going to send ground troops. Uh, I said, we already, we already have troops. We just sent out 120 troops today. Right. I said, but, you know, but I said, but here's what worries me. If you get up on TV and you say that ISIS is the greatest threat that we've ever faced in our entire lives and a bigger threat than Al-Qaeda, and we're still stuck in Afghanistan because of Al-Qaeda, the notion that you wouldn't contemplate putting ground troops, you know, in place to respond to a bigger. Th- I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, you got to lower the hype, or you got to, you know, I mean, or you got to stop saying you're not going to do X, Y, and Z because, you know, when we recessed for, con- you know, for the for the for the August break, um, you know, from from those in those only few weeks, we have we're in, we're now up to our knees in Iraq, and. You know, and you know we'll be up to our necks by the end of the year if we don't, you know, figure. And what it worries me about is if we don't. I don't. We don't have a clearly defined mission. I don't. I, I said to a reporter, so you're bombing ISIS in Iraq because they're a bigger threat than Al Qaeda. Well, what happens if they cross the border into Syria? Do you still bomb them, or the, or, or or not? Because yeah, or, you know, uh, you know. I mean, because it, 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 it you know, if you, if you believe the rhetoric. 
you know, how do you stop it at the border? And you got a government of Iraq where the prime minister doesn't want to step down. Well, what if there's a civil war in Iraq in addition to the fighting with ISIS? Which prime minister do you support? It's just like, you know, and Congress has a role to authorize this stuff. Congress needs to live up to its constitutional responsibilities. But, but you know, but, but, but there's no out-of-the-box creative thinking about not only how we could better respond to this in the short term, like, for example, you know, why aren't we, why, why aren't we working with the neighbors, you know, to do more? Or, you know what, here's an opportunity. Let's reach out to Russia. Let's reach out to Iran. Let's reach out to Turkey. They all hate ISIS. You know, I mean, let's maybe, maybe, we, maybe we can start talking to one another and agree on something, and figure out, you know, a better, a better thing, a better thing to do. And then there's the long-term strategy of, you know, how do you, you know, how do you make it more difficult for extremist groups, you know, that, you know, peddle hate and division, to grow. And my response is, you know, you help people improve a better life. You get better. I mean, in, in Iraq, you got you, you got this going on in part because you got a leader there that has locked half the more than half the population out of any same government. I mean, but it's like you know, the, we, we ought to talk about that. And instead, we all you know, you, when you say these things, people say you look weak. You know, you're weak. You know, the only way you could be strong is drop a bomb on somebody. You know? Who yeah. says that? You're weak. I mean, just I'm sure you know, yeah, 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 we're having a new governor in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and I thought, uh, gee, I really want to be able to have some influence on that person. So um, I am working on the cam on the campaign for the next governor of Massachusetts, and um, I asking them basically one thing. I made a little button. I'm rich. I can afford to pay my taxes, and I'm trying to push the idea that why are we giving away you know corporate welfare, massive tax breaks to people like me and people a lot richer like me. I'm this rich. So, um, so anyway, basically, I'm just working on, I don't know who's going to become mayor, governor, so I'm working for Steve and for Martha and for Charlie Baker, so okay, I get to talk to him. Anyway, I was talking about this idea that, you know, it doesn't change my lifestyle at all if I pay my full taxes. And so this last week, I was out in Seattle, Vashon Island, by Seattle, in an um, artful activist camp. So it gathered uh, 60, oh, maybe 100 people from largely that area, but basically looking on I issues of activism. How do we you know, put out our message? How do we talk to people who aren't us? How do we um, deal with ourselves? We talk, talked a lot about race and ageism and, and sexual orientation or gender issues and stuff like this. But it's this beautiful camp where these people get together and work on, you know, a, we're largely protesters. We spent a lot of time in the streets, and I even learned to climb the trees. It was really fun. I'm never going to do that. But so, um, wonderful time. Lots of people get together. These people are going to be working in the future. And um, because I talked about that rich thing, um, the guy who organized this one week at a youth hostel said, Bill, can you help us? The owner of the youth hostel is selling we can buy it for a million bucks, can you toss in a quarter of a million? And, you know, I thought about what we were doing, being in the future, if we could have, if they could have that place to do activist trainings. You're familiar with the Highland Center in uh, Tennessee? Yeah. Okay, so he is, yeah, he's been talking to them, they're going, oh yeah, this is what we want, the Highland Center on the West Coast uh, version, you know, whatever. And um, so I'm utterly convinced, you know, I, I can actually do this. I can actually write any check for that much. I, it's not going to change my life. And I am just trying to figure out, A, you know, how can I be effective in getting some other people to contribute this? And then just the general question or general idea, do you have any thoughts? Well, one is, thank, uh, you. I, thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, but, but two is, I mean, I, I, I like to think that 
good deeds are contagious. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and that's, you know, um, and, um, you know, and there's some extremely wealthy people now who are now, I, I think I saw Sting is turning a big chunk of his money over to um, all kinds of good causes and leaving his kids comfortable, but not, you know, extravagantly comfortable. Um, I mean, I think, the, the, I think people are kind of following you know, Bill Gates and other people. You know, they're you know they're they're understanding that they can help make the world a better place by sharing some of their wealth. Um, so I think that's a I think that's a good thing. The other thing is, um, again, you know, um, and, I, and I learned this. I, I, I'm coming to understand this way people some people think with with regard to these children on the border. It's as if we if we help them out, that means it's less for me. Yeah. Um, and the deal is, some of us have enough. I mean, some of us have too much, but even too much is not enough in the way we be, we, we talk about things mm -hmm. uh, in this country. Um, you know, um, and I, I worry that, that we're losing kind of a sense of community service. Um, I mean, that's why the Peace Corps is important because it's giving back something. You know, it's it's public service, but. You get a lot of people. This is why colleges, I think, and high schools are really important. Is because I think you know. I think your experiences can inspire some kid to say, "Hey, you know what? I can do that too." Boy, I you know, I, I never thought about maybe spending a couple of years in Kenya or in Ecuador or in El Salvador, or, you know, wherever. You know, I didn't know I could even. Do, some of you are not even don't even know what's out there and what options are available to them. Um, and you know, I mean, you know, experiences like this change your life. I mean, and so it, it's, you know, it, it's so that that activism, you know, that you know, if people get together and figure out, you know, how to spread the word, you know, uh, even if it's just, and I'm also I'm also coming to believe that if you want to do good organizing, you you can't spread out yourself so thin that you're all over the place. I think mean, you got to sometimes take town by town, city by city, school by school, because, um, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. I have seen just incredibly wonderful things that some of the people have done with community organizing. We're building our community gardens time and time again and being successful. And well, we're seeing, that, in, we're, like we're that. seeing that in Worcester, you know, which mm -hmm. in other places too, right. A lot, which is, that, which is, that's, 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 that's a good, you know, that's that's bottom up, not top down, which is really inspiring to me, right? I mean, I, I, and you know, even the Worcester Tree Initiative that we put together in response to the Asian longhorn beetle has now turned into not just trees but orchards, so people can get food, you know. Um, and I mean, it's got a, an orchard in Maine South that will be managed by a bunch, a group of refugees from Bhutan, who will take care of the orchard and who will take the fruits. And uh, you know, sell it at the farmers market, and you know, and earn, earn a little bit of money from it. So I mean, there's there's, there's lots of, but it, you know, we, but I, but it, but but the, what we're talking about right now is not being is not being discussed you know, like in mainstream media. I mean, you you I mean, and you know, I watch MSNBC because. They tend to say, well, what I like in Fox News, right? <laughs> but, but even on MSNBC, you know, you know, you, you don't, you know, everybody's shouting at each other. And, and, everything's, and everything is like breaking news. And everything is a catastrophe. And everything is, ah. Get the eyeballs. Right, no, yeah. yeah, versus, you know, I, I kind of wish we went back to the days when we had three networks. You know, where you had the best science reporter and the best space reporter and the best medical reporter and the best, you know. Yeah. Right now, some of the best news you get comes from the Daily Show right. and the Colbert Report. Right. As far oh, as really you, dealing yeah. with, you know, it's that sad, that but that's mm -hmm. really true. That's I did, I did. My, my wife read the yeah. that. <laughs> and they're more amusing. He's got, got the nail on the head, don't you think? It is. But... I also worry too because I, you know, again, I've got uh, like this show and stuff. So I've been home for a couple of weeks working, or, you know, visiting people, and I've encountered some angry crowds on on this immigration stuff. And yeah. and but, you know what? When people understand what the reality is, like, you know, I mean, it's it, you know that 
these aren't children secretly swimming across the Rio Grande River or running across the desert. These are kids who are filing refugee claims because they have legitimate reasons to fear their life. You know, and they're kids. I think we'd be more generous, you know, with the in income inequality thing we can really is that people are, you know, we have had a flat, for the average worker since 1974, their salary, the average salary is flat, excluding inflation. So I think when people feel tense and stressed, they, they feel less generous. Yeah, I, and I think if they're right. if we were doing better as a society, right. getting back to lower levels of people. But, I, but, I mean, but, I know there is that right. kind but, of but, but I'll tell you the thing, right. you know, right. the, the, the biggest pushback on, on, on these children is not from the low-income neighborhoods. Right. You know, it's from people who are, who are very well off. That right, large. It makes no sense. You know, and they're and they're in, and, yeah. the, and you hear, well, the, what, they'll be they'll come to our school system, and oh, we'll have a Spanish speaking kid who doesn't understand. He'll bring the the the, the, test, scores the test scores down. We'll have to have a special ed teacher for them. We'll have to do this. But so and these yeah. so these are these are people. Yeah. You know, because okay. that's the thing. So you got it, the NIMBY yeah, effect. Yeah, because you get because it's you know there's. I get income inequality is a big issue issue right. in this country, right. um, but on this, some of the angriest mm. pushback can come from people who really have no reason yeah. to believe that they're going to be in any worse shape as a result of it. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, some of that. When you look at that, though, I mean, since the '80s, the shift. Like, my parents were both came with high school educations and started with. My father worked for GM. Yeah. He. Um, for, for years, yeah, was a union man. My mother went back to school to become a nurse. And out of that income, joint income, especially after she went back to school, she was able to send both me and my brother through yeah. college or whatever without help and assistance. You can't do that no. now. It's impossible. And, you know, that's a sad yeah. effect of what happened during the 80s and the stuff that went on. And it's changed the country, it's changed the dynamics, it's changed politics. You've got the corporations really contributing to um, people in the Congress and said, you can't run it. So it's just the whole landscape has changed. And that's yeah, no, shifted I, I, how people look at things. But I, and I agree with you on that. Um, and, um, but I, I, I'm a, this is my feeling. I, I think racism has more to do with the issue that's, on the border than income inequality. Yeah, but racism also has to do with the food stamp. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and right, it's yeah. always been there, right. but and that also came up during, a lot of it was pushed forward from the 80s, and you get, right. I mean, Reagan did it, Clinton yeah. also used it to a certain extent to, as, you know, the whole thing of the, the whole welfare, right. yeah. Yeah, and Reform. that's still there. Right. And it's used to keep people in certain positions and with little money thinking that that's who's doing this to me. Right. Yeah, no, so, and that's uh, not But that's just the way. But you know, I, I said, I, I was explaining to on the, on the uh, refugee kids, you know, that you know, people, this group I was talking to, this woman came and gave me that about the border, the south of the border, the border of the south of the south. I said, you know what, there's a border in the north, too. <laughs> yeah. And you know what, and people come through here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. you know, and of the millions of undocumented immigrants in the United States, millions of them and millions of them don't come from. Latin America. Yeah, they extreme. come from Africa. They come from Korea. They come from, you know, Europe. They come from Canada, Russia. I mean, you know, I mean, and you know, Ireland. A lot of Irish come in. They come in. You know what their border is? Kennedy Airport. They land at Kennedy Airport and they don't have to go back. <laughs> no you know what? And so, yeah, so you, you're all, you, you know, it's all this kind of. Yeah. But uh, but you're yeah. right. Uh, you know, look. I mean, we have a problem right now where you, you've got corporations that are being treated, being recognized as people by our courts. Yeah. You've got we have we, we 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 can't even pass campaign finance reform even if we wanted to because the Supreme Court has said it's all unconstitutional. And so you've got the wealthiest elements and the wealthiest individuals and the wealthiest corporate interests. That are buying elections, and you know, and you know, one of the, you know, I, I've heard, I've heard kind of, uh, you know, I, I heard a really kind of depressing analysis of why we're going to lose the my side, the Senate, and even more in the House you know, come November. But the analysts said at the end of it. But the good news is, the things that are going to get so awful and so terrible <laughs> and in 2016, it's going to be a Great, you know, great coming. People don't the, vote for right. The, the problem, the, yeah, the problem is sometimes catastrophe leads to salvation, yeah. but sometimes catastrophe leads to catastrophe. Yeah. And you got people, you know, you got 50 million people in the United States who are hungry, 
you know, you've got 17 million or or kids, um, and you've got a government system that provides less and less and less. And you know, I tied this conversation with the president, and I, and I you know, and I, I'm waiting for some leadership on this. But you know, I mean, he, they wouldn't fight the food stamp cuts. Yeah. Um, and you know, and mm-hmm. so okay. Politically, why? Right, because, you know, they, they thought they were engaged in a compromise that they could live with. Except if you were a food stamp recipient, you got your benefits cut. The first learning is that we need to stop talking among ourselves. And it's okay to get in good discourse, but we need to talk to other people. Sure. Um, and if it's always the same people talking, we feel good about who we are and we think it's them. But when you say you have people who write hate mail or that you've had some hostile meetings, but when they hear where these kids are coming from, how they're getting here and what they're housed in, it changes. Right. We need to accept those conversations. Right. That's the first learning. And I think, you know, what can we do? The second, and I think you also hit the nail on the head, and I think all of us are doing that, is not just rely on our generation, but we got to make sure the high school students and the college students. I, I, I just have to share with you one of our good mutual friends, Jeffrey Pucci, I heard from him today. Yeah. He's in Tanzania. He's building a soccer field for a group of kids that live in an orphanage. And, I mean, I heard from him at 11.30 today. Yeah. I mean, he's a great, you know, um, it, as an example of how one person can make a difference. He helped organize not only Holy Cross, but all these colleges yeah. to do these public service projects here in, in Worcester, and um, you know, and 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 I think that what he started, I think, is continuing. Because mm-hmm. others say, "I want to do the same thing." That's why I think some of this is contagious. It's like, but we don't give enough. We don't provide people enough examples and opportunities for it to be contagious. And that's you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I that, that's, I mean, I, that's why I I always I try to speak as many high school campuses and college campuses as I possibly can. And when people tell me, you know, they you know, I, you know, I, I've had, you know, members of Young Americans for Freedom tell me that they think I'm, the, you know, the worst thing in the world. As you know, his my, like, you know what? Run for office. You know, get involved <laughs> in the process because you know, I mean, it, it and, and 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 here's where I think though, you know, where kind of a, a more concerted effort on those younger people can make a difference because I think you get a lot of younger people who do not believe that they can change the world. And, you know, and you can give them concrete proof that you did, you know? And, uh, you know, changing the world, it doesn't mean you have to be president of the United States, <laughs> you know, or emperor of the world. Right. You could change the world in a hundred different ways. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, thank you, thank you. Wait, uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Just yeah. one to li- go towards a hopeful note in it. Um, I found out about a program uh, that my ne- nine-year-old nephew was in, where he was selected to go to uh, France and to England for a week each as an ambassador. And from my brother's comments, and when he came back, he had changed, to- just the change in, in him from two weeks, right. and he's nine. Um, and as you said, Peace Corps does change you so that when I came back to the States, I went into graduate school. And when I look at the stuff that's going on now, I had friends from grad school who were from Egypt, who were from Iraq, from, you know. So when, it, when I see those stories, I don't see something far off or something happening to people that don't matter or whatever. I think of my friends and my classmates who are probably very involved in all of this because right. they were all into political, it was a political, it was political science. So that is the difference that that kind of thing can make in you because it's not something far off in a way that you have to worry about about other people. It's people that you know. So, so what, what can we do better locally here? I think one thing we can do locally in terms of advocacy and getting the word out is the third goal, which everyone in this room is doing. Um, and it's not just advocating for Peace Corps, it's advocating for what people don't know. As Americans, there's a lot we don't know and we, we're afraid of it. So getting out there and just spreading the word about how other countries aren't as intimidating as they might appear, and that one day at a time you can do it, just to take the first step, apply. Um, But even after that, right now I have friends at my house that are embassy employees at Rome, they're staying here, and they were talking about how the Peace Corps employees that are now U.S. diplomats 
are the most effective because of our conflict negotiation skills, our understandings of what it's like to live in the rural areas in developing countries. So encouraging people just to step outside of your comfort box for five minutes and then try 10 and just go from there. And it's like Tim said, the yeah. six of us talking, seven of us, it's great. But have, what can we do from there? I have one other thing that's happening this year. I'm doing the racism movement. Are you familiar with that? Yep. Um, I'm doing that uh, racism movement. Okay. I think you know, it's going to be doing it. Are you working with the city or are you, are you doing it? Uh, the city, the car of Hell. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. And, and yeah. Um, the car of Hell. Right. That's really important. Well, um, and I'll, because I believe the racism is one of the biggest issues in resistance against Obama. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Believe me, I, 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 I agree with you. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's unconscious a lot of it, but maybe some of it's conscious. And I, I think I think you're right on that. You know, if I, if I if I could wish one thing for the president, however, which would be helpful, is I wish he enjoyed politics a little bit more, because you know, I mean, Tip O'Neill used to say oh, to me when I was going to run for office, he's remembered two things. Is people like to be asked, and they like to be thanked. Right. And right. for whatever reason, it's very hard for this president to it's do that. Cool. And, yeah. and yeah, and ask and to thank. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We're going to do a big group picture. I'm sorry. Yeah. But I, I like. I, don't give me. I, I, I'm a big support. I just. But it's just. It's yeah, like yeah, the. It's gonna get, it's gonna get side to side, shoulder to shoulder. When you, you see the movie Lincoln, you realize that the Emancipation Proclamation Act was more than a, a speech. It was, you know, we gotta. We got a schmooze. Read with uh, Curtis Goodwin's book, uh, TR. We are thankful for the meeting. Thank you. So we're going to take pictures and we are going to post them on Facebook, Twitter, and our blog. And we'll get them to the Peace Corps Corporate uh, we need and CPA. To stop speaking. Show us your pretty surprise. Good. Thank Thanks you. For thank you so much. No, thank you. So if, if anything I need to be involved with, Specifically, it's under, it's under, it's under, it's under. yeah. Well, let me know if this is for me any of this stuff. Absolutely. All right, nice to see you. Thank you for having us. Jim, I'll see you. Uh, let me know if this is for you. Thank you. Hey, thank nice you. Thank 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 you.